Hello, my name is Deborah Rolls and I'm filming this from Canada in week five of our COVID-19 self-isolation measures. And so let me ask, how are y'all doing? Or as we might say in Canada, are you doing okay, eh? I know, so corny. Um, many of us have turned to humor as a way to cope through this crisis and we've seen the creativity on YouTube channels, Instagram, Facebook pages and it's been good to laugh. It's broken some of the tension. It's maybe dispelled some of our fear. And at the end of March, an actor by the name of John Krenke started his own YouTube show called Some Good News. Maybe some of you have even watched it. You may remember John from his role as Jim Halpert on the very popular TV sitcom from a few years ago called The Office or from his Amazon Prime series called Jack Ryan. Anyway, John, who's quarantined at home like the rest of us, is taping this 15-minute show once a week to showcase some heartwarming good news stories that are sent to him by his fans. And he said that he wants to provide a place where people can have their spirits lifted, a, a place of positivity in the midst of this pandemic. And his show has become a, a, something of an internet sensation. He's attracting millions of viewers each week and people from around the globe are sending them their own heartwarming, feel-good news stories to share on his channel. But there's another parallel phenomenon that I discovered this week that's happening at the same time. I got an email uh, that I earlier in the week that startled me. And the email featured some statistics from the Barna Group and GLU, which is spelled G-L-O-O, -O, which are two companies that have been collecting real-time data on church engagement during the pandemic. And this is what startled me. According to their research, 49% of the churches that they've surveyed, which are in Canada and the United States, report that their churches have experienced growth since the church became exclusively digital. That compares to only 15% of churches reporting growth prior to the pandemic. So what's the reason behind this big jump? Well, Gary Newhoff, who's a Canadian pastor based in Barrie, Ontario, which does, he, he does some work with this group, these groups, explains it this way. Well, as our world dramatically changed almost overnight and people's personal worlds were deeply altered and in some cases collapsed, people began looking toward God for answers. He also says that, interestingly, Google searches for terms such as prayer, church, God, and church online have all spiked significantly in recent weeks. So it seems to me that amidst the turmoil, people are looking not just for some good news, but they're checking out what the church has always offered, the good news. Some of the good news shared by John Kroninke is good news about some people that can make us feel good for a moment. But the good news that the church teaches and that Jesus Christ offers is good news of great joy for all people everywhere. So what is the good news that people are hungering for and want to know more about? Why are they turning to the church? Well, the good news is that God loves us so much that he sent his son into the world to teach us about him, but also to rescue us from our own self-destructive tendencies. The word we use in the church for this is sin. 
And Jesus accomplished this for God by clearing our name, or you could think of it as paying our debt through his death on a cross. But that's not the end of the story. Three days later, Jesus arose from his tomb fully alive and with the promise that such a resurrection was possible for all who believe in him. And we call this miraculous event the resurrection. And we believe the eyewitness accounts that he returned to life not in a spirit form, but that his flesh and blood body was restored to life. Now the scriptures tell us that over 500 people are reported to have seen Jesus after his resurrection and that they believed this to be true. And it birthed such hope and such courage in them that Jesus' followers were prepared and in fact did defy the Roman authorities of that time. And many were even killed because they told everyone they knew about Jesus. Many were tortured and killed for doing so, but they could not deny what they had seen with their own eyes. It was Roman domination that killed opponents and curtailed freedoms in Jesus' day. It was the Romans, in fact, who had invented crucifixion, which was the most humiliating and excruciating way to die. But Jesus triumphed over the worst death that they could conceive of and turned it into the best gift that we could ever receive. And so the hope he offered went viral. In fact, the offer that Jesus extends to all of us today, whether we're rich or poor, famous or obscure, educated or not, was and still is the greatest viral story in the history of humanity. And it's all recorded in the Bible, the best-selling book of all time. Since you have more time to do reading these days, I encourage you to pick one up. So today, when we're not facing a visible Roman army, but an invisible virus that has shaken us to our core and brought the world as we know it to a standstill, I'd like to share with you one small portion of a letter written by one of Jesus' students. In the Bible, you're going to find that such students are referred to as disciples. And this disciple's name was Peter, and I'm going to read to you from his first letter, chapter 1, verses 3 to 6. And I'm going to read to you from the New International Version. So here's what he wrote to the world that was suffering under Roman oppression. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, by his great mercy, he has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled and unfading, kept in heaven for you who are being protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Well, Peter knew how to pack a lot of meaning into just a few words. So together, let's take a closer look at this. What is he trying to tell his first readers, but also trying to tell us today? Well, first, Peter is so joyful about what he's going to share. He praises God. He raves about what God has done for us by sending Jesus to earth and resurrecting him from the dead. This goes beyond happiness. This has transformed his life. And then he says that we've been given a new birth 
In other words, we get to start over. We, we get to have a fresh start. God is giving us a do-over. So if we've denied God's existence in the past, he says he'll forgive us if we accept him now. If we've displeased him by hurting others and ourselves, he says it's all forgotten if we trust that Jesus has wiped our slate clean. It's a new, fresh birth, Peter says. And, and then he goes on to say that because of our fresh start, our new birth, we have a living hope. So let's think about that for a moment. What is hope? How do we define it? Well, hope is an expectation, isn't it? Hope is an expectation and a reasonable confidence in a better life, in a better future. The hope Jesus gives to us, says Peter, is not false hope. It is not dead hope. It is living hope. A hope that gives us breath. A hope that keeps us moving forward to share this good news and to bring others comfort and care. It's a hope that helps us to grow into and to develop that same love that Jesus has for us. Peter says that once we were dead, even if we didn't know it, we were dead because we were separated from God, who is the creator of life itself. And as we've been safely cocooning at home, perhaps we've read a lot about death. Deaths from the coronavirus, to be sure, but Perhaps we've also reflected on other forms of death in our world today. The death of our environment. The death of marriages. The death of real in-person social connections. The death of belonging. The death of meaning. What is life all about anyway? And here's what Peter says is the meaning. He says, we have an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade away. It's kept in heaven for you. It's an inheritance that will never decay. That means it can never die. Peter says, God is waiting for us to join him in heaven, but also that we're going to be provided for here on earth. It's a living inheritance. We don't have to die before we receive it. We receive it now. It's good news for today, but also for all of eternity. And Jesus did it first. He shows us it can be done because through him, the impossible became possible. Indeed, isn't it true that we see new life, new birth, even now? As we've had to cease from our usual activities, we see healing in our environment. I looked up at the sky in my suburban neighborhood the other night and I saw stars. That never happens. It filled me with wonder and joy. The pollution is clearing. We also see new life in that we are appreciating and understanding in a new way our need for in-person connection. True, we're grateful for this technology that connects us right now, but I also think we'd agree that it's a poor substitute for a hug. And perhaps we're also wondering about the pace of our former lives. Have we made time for the important or just the urgent in the past? And have we reflected on how much is truly out of our control that, that something, that someone, orders our days and numbers the days of our lives? This pause in our lives might be an invitation to do this kind of reflection, to go beyond temporary feel-good stories, as heartwarming as they might be, to go deeper, to reflect on Jesus, who has never gone away. Even as we may have forgotten about him, 
in the rush of our daily lives. And so friends, as we wait for this crisis to be over, he waits for us. He waits for us to discover his good news. He waits for us to invite him into our lives and to know his peace, his love, and his presence for today and forever. Amen. Amen. If this is the first time that you've heard this good news, then I invite you to seek out a local church and speak with someone about it. Get connected, even if it has to be a virtual connection right now. Or maybe someone has sent you this video and it's piqued your curiosity then I invite you to talk to them more about why they decided to share it with you. Why is Jesus important to them? So now before we depart from one another, let us join in a moment of prayer. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, every day we read more bad news, news of death, news of the continuing need to isolate ourselves from others, News of healthcare workers stretched to the breaking point, and we wonder, how long, O oh Lord, how long must this continue? And so, Father, we pray for those whose pain and suffering at this time is so overwhelming and complete that they cannot see any good. Give them perseverance and strength, we pray, to endure the loss of loved ones, the loss of steady income, the loss of peace, even the loss of rest. We weep with them. You understand loss and grief, for you gave your only son to die on a cross on our behalf. You see a bigger picture than we can ever conceive, so help us to trust you that you will bring good from this time of pain. We see only what is visible. Yet we know that you are active and working behind the scenes. And we see signs of hope. We see your work in the clearing of our skies and rivers. You are bringing healing to our environment. We see families spending more time together and creating memories that wouldn't have otherwise happened. We see neighbors getting acquainted with one another. These are among the signs of new birth of living hope, even in the midst of death and pain. Help us to be people of hope to those who right now see no hope. Help us to offer comfort in whatever way we are able. Help us to bring your good news to those who desperately need it. The good news that death does not have the last word because Jesus overcame it and through it we can too. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Goodbye and good night.